Um, hello, welcome. Thank you for your patience while I just did a uh, little bit of technical setting up there. My name is Rebecca Bennett um, and I'm here to talk to you about a project that I'm currently coordinating um, across Europe, uh, as has already been mentioned, to look at how we um, provide guidelines for the use of LiDAR data in heritage management. Um, so a little bit about me, in case you haven't met me before, though there's a lot of familiar faces in the room, it's very nice to see. Um, I specialised in LIDAR as part of my PhD just over a decade ago. Um, and what I realised that while I was looking at the, the application of that um, in, a, in an academic context, um, very little of the information about best practice was filtering through into the commercial or, or, or the other sectors in, in which we all operate as heritage professionals. So I've dedicated the last 10 years to um, training up professionals and people in the community to use LiDAR data in order to be able to understand the landscapes in which they're living and working to contribute to their research and to contribute towards um, uh, their, their sort of uh, their aims in terms of managing um, the landscape. Um, so, so just to jump onto this uh, guidance and a little bit more about this, you'll probably all have heard of the um, uh, European Archaeological um, Congress. Uh, the idea really is to um, um, enable a democratic network of heads of heritage management right the way across Europe. So, th so this organisation that I'm currently uh, working on behalf of in producing these guidelines really has an emphasis on, on heritage management and on en enabling heritage managers from across the continent to come together um, to discuss problems, to solve problems, or sometimes just to commiserate over the problems that they're all facing in different jurisdictions in different countries um, and, and across the way. I have to say that I attended my first EAC conference um, just last month and was really impressed at how um, important, uh, how impactful it was to be able to bring together so many different people um, from, from across the continent to, to, to leverage um, that, uh, that knowledge, really. Um, and it was very nice to be able to do that. Um, so where where do I sit within that? Well, the um, EAC has a series of working groups and the remote sensing working group was established in 2007. Um, as I say, it's one of six other EAC working parties and, and really this is a collaboration between the Aerial Archaeological Research Group and the Institute for Archaeological Prospection. Um, and the idea here is to promote the use of um, the use of remote sensing and non and un and non-destructive investigation methods um, across the continent to be able to support the use of landscape frameworks in terms of heritage management um, and to be able to promote integrated landscape protection, management and planning, but with remote sensing techniques at its core. Um, a really important part of what the AAC do is to provide guidelines. So to provide guidelines that are appropriate to the sector right the way across Europe. And we've already talked a little bit um, Jen's already spoken about the, the levels at which you can apply standards versus guidelines and how do you make that truly international. Well, this is something that the AAC have been grappling with um, for a, a long while. So if you headed over to their website, and I'm sure you will have, you'll see that there's several different um, uh, sets of guidelines. And the most uh, closely comparable one, also organised by the Remote Sensing Working Group, was the guidelines into the use of geophysics um, for archaeology. So these were published in 2015, um, collated predominantly by Armin Schmidt with help from um, Paul Linford, Neil, Andrew, uh, Chris Apostolos and York. Um, and the idea of any of these um, guidelines produced by the EAC is to be able to um, give a not just a, a range of um, guidelines but also examples and case studies and applications so, so people can see the practical implementation of how um, these data should be used. Um, so the Existing geophysical survey guidelines, excellent read, would very much recommend it, but very much done in the sort of traditional way of producing um, guidelines, which is to get a, a group of experts into a room, examine the existing guidance that is already out there, uh, pick it apart, work out what you want to, to use and what is applicable, and then add in filling the gaps and producing a, a nice final document really under the leadership of, of one individual. I think everybody acknowledged that it was mostly Armin's hard work that, that got that guide, set of guidelines um, out and published and, and to fruition. Um, and principally, these guidelines were based on the work on the um, the documentation produced by Historic England. So while they are designed to be applicable across Europe, we were very aware that there was an Anglo-centric starting point um, for, for that particular piece of work. Um, so rolling forward to the project that I'm working on at the moment, um, 
there was a recognition from the AAC more broadly, this was a, definitely a sort of top-down request in it, to some extent, um, that LIDAR data are integral to many of the aspects of um, heritage management and landscape management across um, Europe in the 21st century. There's a huge diversity of approaches, however, um, and this combined with a relatively small number of specialists spread across the continent, um, leaves uh, a lot of space for um, uh, knowledge gaps. And so there was really room here to be able to develop a pan-continental set of guidelines that showcased good practice and help people to um, not only sort of know what they wanted, so to be an informed client um, if, if working with these data, but also if you are a specialist working within um, your current skill set, your future skill set, how you might want to build a team around this. So really looking quite broadly at the topic, not only of, but of sort of skill sets and expertise within the sector as a whole, and how we might come together to, to improve that and move it forward. So the aim here is to collate a LIDAR guidance document for heritage man managers, principally as our, as our core target audience, um, bringing together expertise of um, uh, LIDAR specialists from right the way across Europe. Um, so how are we going to do that? Well, we all know sort of the, the main principles of it, but I'm going to talk through the approach that we have decided to take and, and the reasons behind that. And hopefully um, that might lead to some quite interesting discussion perhaps um, uh, as we go through. We thought the most sensible starting point was to actually find out who and what and where and why survey. So this is a little bit along the lines of the idea of a profiling of the profession. So not only do we want to write to the EAC membership and say, hey, we're writing some guidelines, how many of you want to contribute, who wants to be involved? We also wanted to find out how LIDAR was currently being used across the different jurisdictions, across different countries, and across different sorts of applications um, across Europe as well. Um, this work hadn't really been done before, um, and there's a lot of data that we gathered um, and presented at the Aerial Archaeology Research Conference um, last September as part of this. Um, but I'll very quickly kind of um, uh, run through uh, the, the, some of the, the, the prescient um, points that came through from this survey inform the way that we've approached pulling together the guidelines. Um, so the survey itself ran from the 1st of May to the 30th of June 2022. Take note, two entire months for people. Um, we did lots and lots of reminding. So it was disseminated through the EAC um, networks, but also through ARG, through ISAP and through CIFA um, themselves here to try and get as many respondents as possible. Um, we mapped the role of participants into five core categories, and I apologise for the very tiny um, uh, writing down there, especially for those of you who are sitting behind by the pillar. That must be really difficult to see uh, from the back there. Uh, so essentially, we, we mapped what people told us uh, in terms of the work they were doing into five categories, starting with cultural heritage manager, and that's the blue segment, uh, researcher, which is orange, early career researcher, uh, which is yellow, uh, green, which is commercial archaeology, and uh, red, which is community archaeology. And as you can see from that lovely uh, pie chart there, the vast majority of people responding were cultural heritage managers, but we also had quite a good response from both uh, research and commercial um, sectors within. The only really kind of underrepresented, I suppose, uh, sector that you could say there would be those working specifically and directly with communities to deliver LIDAR projects. Um, in terms of the coverage, oops, there we go. Um, we had 107 responses in total. The highest number were from the UK. So we're already kind of sitting back into that Anglo-centric or the sort of UK-centric bias there and making ourselves aware of that. Um, but 33 of the 39 EAC member countries were represented. And um, Jenny uh, kindly informs me that that's actually a really good response rate. And we, we were really pleased um, with the, the level of uptake uh, of this particular survey. And we feel that... Um, this gives us a good a sense of um, the information being told to us as being representative of what's actually going on in the sector. Um, we asked all sorts of different questions, and I won't go into each of them now because this is not the presentation I gave last September. Um, but really what we wanted to understand was how were they using LIDAR? So we had various different um, categories that we we sort of suggested to them. But for each of these, we also had free text fields because we were interested in the things that we hadn't already thought about as well. Um, so as you can see here, research in blue, heritage management in orange, landscape assessment in yellow, planning and development control in green, and then community engagement in a kind of disgustingly browny burgundy colour there on the, on the end. Um, but really interesting to me with those additional uses, so prospection, targeted field survey, digital preservation, um, 
assessing the impacts of climate change, specifically through coastal monitoring, but through other applications as well. Um, and then tying really tightly into um, transport infrastructure policy and rights of way, a property boundary um, work too. So this really confirms to us that there was um, that the, the uses were, were diverse and that we needed to be able to, um, to, to tackle that within the guidelines or speak to that within the guidelines. Um, the other thing that we, that we wanted to uh, pin down was what were people using already? Because although there is no EAC guidance document, we know that there's bound to be guidance documents across different countries. We have them here, um, here in the UK. Um, the two most common, uh, it probably won't surprise you, is the Historic England Light Fantastic document, uh, the Cock Island Hess, which is a much more technical visualisation um, process document that many of you will have come across, um, but then also tying down um, which of the organisations were recorded as having their own internal guides and trying to sort of get copies of those, understanding which of those were English language, which of those were um, various different language specific um, guides. So really trying to pull together what already existed what needs it was meeting and what needs it wasn't meeting before we started the process of writing anything. Really importantly, as part of this survey, we asked people to identify what the key areas of challenge were to them and how the guidance might be able to meet those challenges and help them move forward. Um, really here, uh, number one that was highlighted really was that data quality and accessibility. Number two, lack of standards of guidance. Hello, that's the one that we're gonna, we're gonna try and solve here but also lines along resourcing capacity, um, the level of skill and capability, um, how we record things even, sort of uh, looking at standards of um, recording and GIS protocols, um, right up to the high level of things like strategic integration. So how do you enable people who are sitting sort of further up the management chain from you, uh, right the way down to, to um, people on the ground? How do you engage that entire chain with understanding what LiDAR data is, how you're using it and how you should use it? Uh, and finally, their public engagement. Now, I've got a funny feeling that there's a couple of slides here because I'm using a slightly different version of the PowerPoint that are going to show that I wasn't going to talk about. Um, so I might have to skip through some a little bit quickly. But all this will be available to you, so you can come back and, and read it at another point. Um, so yeah, these are ones that I wasn't planning to talk through in great detail because nobody wants to hear me talking through a series of bullet points. Um, but essentially, you'll see that this underpins the way in which we can start to understand what those, what those concerns are, what those queries are, what the real need across the profession is for each of these challenges. Um, and then the final kind of other really, really important question they asked was, what, what do you want to see? What, what do you feel like you need guidance on? What, what are the areas that need covering? And once again, I'm not going to talk through each word on these slides, so please don't worry. Um, but we were able to categorise specific areas, um, uh, 10 of them in total, she says, double checking her slides, um, that we wanted to speak to specifically as part of this uh, LIDAR guidance process. So we've got commissioning survey, interpretation and recording, um, how do we archive uh, LIDAR data, how, do, how does uh, the work that we do interface with uh, good practice in archiving, um, right the way through to automated feature processing, um, planning, development, control, public and non-specialist engagement, et cetera, et cetera. So a really broad church. Which is what we expected, because we knew that there were a huge range of applications. We knew that we were speaking to a very large audience. We knew that we were speaking to a very diverse audience um, of people trying to, to, to manage these data, but also people trying to do things um, with these data as well. Um, so what do we do about all this? So we've got this really useful um, insight into to where we are, into what people are doing and into what they want and what they need. Well, the great thing about doing a survey is that as part of doing that survey, you can ask people if they want to contribute towards pulling these guidelines together. So out of the um, 107 participants, almost half of the 107 participants in the survey, almost half of them said that they wanted to be actively involved in some way in producing the guidelines with us, um, which I think is a pretty great result. Um, uh, so we were able to hold a seminar which um, back in July of last year, which presented the results of the survey and started to talk through these areas and to confirm whether that was what, what the group wanted. And then following on from that, we were able to, I pulled together a draft structure for the guidelines and then we spent two more um, online seminars um, discussing those, uh, that, that structure um, and which um, elements should be covered within each of them. So already, by the time we've got to this exceptionally boring slide, we have had a huge amount of contributive effort from right the way across um, the, the continent. And really, um, 
one of the reasons why I'm here talking about this today is that I think that the approach that we've taken to these guidelines is, is not an easy one necessarily because it's, it's hugely collaborative and there are a lot of people involved. There are a lot of people around the table. But what we can already see is that it is paying dividends. It's paying dividends for the amount of expertise that we've got in the room at any given time. Um, it's paying dividends for the conversations that are being spurred from each of these working parties because following the um, two whole group um, working seminars that we had at the end of last year. Um, we were able to refine a contributors list and assign people to particular sections. From this January onwards, uh, 54 confirmed contributors from 20 different countries are working together to produce the, the drafts of different sections of the guidelines. Um, how are we doing this? Some of you might wonder. Well, thank goodness for... I know, I'm not going to say that out loud. Um, because, uh, because of the pandemic, because everybody's got really used to online working, it has made my life much easier because people have got very used to being able to collaborate on Zoom. And I don't mean just me talking to them and, and people listening quietly in a darkened room. People have been very able to, to get on these meetings, either a Zoom or a Teams meeting, and really talk about um, their topic and work it out. But to help that, and my role in this is really to facilitate that work. Um, so I've set up um, email groups for communication so people can more easily talk to each other and nobody's left off that email trail. Um, I've set up a, a Google Drive folder so that all the information is stored in, in the right place with the right permissions so that people can both see their work and other people's work. Um, because as you'll imagine, if everybody's writing separate chapters, it's really important to be able to cross-reference to what other people are writing also. Um, I created template documents for each subsection, so they've got their headings, they know sort of who's contributing to what. Um, and as a Tira library, really importantly, to be able to collect those references, those, those um, external um, uh, papers and references and documentation that will be relevant to each of them. Um, and the other thing that I do is I support the authors, or during this phase I'm supporting the authors, sometimes by kind of showing up to their meetings if they want me to be, to be there and sort of take notes, but also by organising monthly check-ins, and our next one is on Friday. Um, those check-ins are always recorded as a matter of principle, so that if you can't meet one, you can listen back to it in, in your own time. Um, and then the other really key bit um, that Jenny uh, very, very handily has already spoken to, actually, in her... Um, uh, question or her comment on the previous paper. Um, part of my role and the role of uh, Rachel and um, uh, John as part of the EAC working group is to be able to maintain those links with the wider EAC. So one of the reasons that I was along at the, contract, uh, the conference last month was to understand where all these other pro projects and programs are within the EAC so that not only are we tying chapters within our guidance to other chapters, but we're tying our guidance to the other guidance that is currently um, in progress. So two really important pieces of work are, are currently in progress. Jenny's already spoken about the legislation review, um, specifically relating to planning across Europe, and there's, a, there's going to be a report on that published in about spring of next year. Um, but then the second one is on um, uh, landscape research um, frameworks which is another really important set of guidance that we'll need to tie this information into. So there's quite a lot of sideways juggling, if that's a thing, and also upwards juggling and backwards juggling and, um, yeah, generally keeping, uh, keeping the, the project on track. Um, how is it going? Well, this is the programme and this is where we are. So um, apologies that it's my slightly less preferred format, so it's dropped off the bottom a little bit there, but that is the last line. Um, as I mentioned, we'd already undertaken the baseline survey, the initial seminar, seminar on formulation of working groups. Um, we expect to have the draft chapters completed by August 2023. So the individual co-authors will submit drafts to me in June and I will spend the summer uh, writing, co-writing, editing through that. Uh, it will then go off to an external editor through the autumn um, with a review of the whole text by the working group in that autumn period as well. So what I'm trying to, to highlight here is the engagement at all stages. So we've got people who engaged at the baseline survey, who have then gone on to author or co-author, and um, also people who didn't have the time to author something but still wanted to contribute, so are going to step back in at the editing stage to review, um, trying to keep this process as open and as flexible as possible to respect the fact that many people 
want to contribute but have varying amounts of time in which to do so um, and truly trying to make it possible for people to contribute in a in a in a valid and useful way um, regardless of the fact that they you know they might not have a couple of hours to spend actually writing a, a piece of work um, on, on our behalf or with us. So the, the result of this will be presentation to the EAC for approval in March 2024, which means that you should be able to see this as a document um, by summer next year, which will be a really uh, satisfying end process. Oh, I did also incentivize any of the authors who are able to complete their work without me chasing them uh, by offering them a beer at the ARG conference in Zagreb in September. And that seems to have worked pretty well so far, actually. Um, we, we've seen really good progress uh, kind of across the board um, for almost all the, all, the, all the projects and sections. And it's really nice as the owner of all these Google documents to see. I get, you know, obviously notifications of when things are edited and when things are commented through. Um, so that's really, really nice to see. Um, I just wanted to, to kind of wrap up with um, a slide that talks a bit more to how this method is going. Because as you can imagine, it's, I'm not going to say it's like herding cats because it certainly hasn't been like herding cats, but it's bringing a lot of different people together um, from a lot of different countries through language barriers also. Um, so, so how is it going? Um, what, are, is it, um, what are the benefits and what have been some maybe of the disadvantages of approaching it in such a, a broadly collaborative way? Uh, well, first of all, I truly believe, and this is absolutely showing the case in the, the draft documentation that we've got so far, that bringing people together has made a much stronger um, document with more useful content. We are able to really speak to those needs um, and have the right people in the room to provide the expertise to, to write those guidelines. I also don't believe that that expertise or diversity of experience could have been accessed really in any other way. Um, and this comes back to the idea that if you don't ask people, then you're not going to you're not going to get it. And I have been blown away by the the quantity and the sort of the, the level of commitment to this project that so many of my colleagues have shown. I'm really grateful for that um, because I don't think that um, I, I don't think that the guidelines would be anywhere near as strong without that without that contribution. Um, but this was mentioned before in terms of how are we going to disseminate the, the guidelines and I strongly believe that the, through having so many people involved um, with the project, they're going to go out there and they're going to be advocates for it. They're going to advocate for it within their own organisation, they're going to advocate for it within their own country, um, to, their, to their peers, to their managers. Um, and I think that can only be a good thing because we all know that if you're sort of reference something on an internet site somewhere, you're far less likely to go and look at it. if than if somebody you personally know has been involved with it, can speak to it, can direct you to the relevant part of the guidelines. So my hope is that that will really make, make sure the guidelines have impact and can be used. Um, and this really seg segues nicely into the work that CIFA are doing, I think. The engagement with that guideline process, so the involvement that people, individuals have been able to have, I hope will trickle down into improved engagement with other guideline and guidance um, creation processes. Um, so obviously we are talking at a pan-European level and that means that our guidance needs to be, to some extent, general um, and, and generic, um, while also being quite specific on, on certain topics, as you would imagine. But there is absolutely room for that to nest within regional, country, sector guidance. And my hope is because we are really very, very much lacking um, guidance in, with respect to remote sensing, specifically LIDAR, because it's probably our most widely used remote sensing technique at the moment. Um, but certainly uh, with respect to others, we just don't have the information there to hand for, particularly for heritage managers to, to go to um, and to reference. So my hope is that that really will trickle down. Um, the other point I wanted to make was that um, all the way through, I've tried to make it uh, really open and really clear exactly how we're pulling these guidelines together. So as anybody who's ever engaged in this sort of um, project will be aware, you are always open to levelling of criticism of, well, well, you know, why didn't you talk to this person or do this person or why haven't you done this in this particular way? And I'm super happy to take those kind of criticisms. It's, it's no problem to me. But what I hope to show is that by um, being able to clearly demonstrate that audit trail. So how did we come up with the topics for this guideline? Well, we asked the sector. How many people did we ask? Well, we got 107 responses from both organisations and individuals. So for me, that clarity of method, that being able to have the, the audit trail of our processes is, is quite important to um, being able to, to sort of quantify the quality of the work. Um, 
Now, I won't lie, it is a lot of work. It's a lot of work for me in terms of coordination. Um, and arguably, it's a lot more work for me in terms of editing and writing. Um, and this, you know, with no element of shade being cast, when your co-author's first language is in English, then there can be quite a lot more work to do. But that is work that I am absolutely happy to take on because their expertise is so much more valuable to me um, than, than anything else, uh, anything that I could write or I could do. Um, so, and the nod to that is really, I'm very, very lucky that the AAC have been able to provide a, an amount of funding to, to support me um, to be able to do this work. But I think it bears thinking about as a sector, how, how do we support individuals to do this work? Because a, small, <laughs> a fraction of my time is paid to do this, um, but everybody else involved in the project is giving that, that time and that expertise for free. Um, <laughs> but as I mentioned, um, without that, that sort of work in terms of coordination editing, I, I would have had to do all this work anyway. So this would this would have all fallen at my door. Um, but frankly, we have a much more collaborative and uh, and better piece of work um, as a consequence. And the other perhaps slight disadvantage here that of course there is an expanded timeline. For this because all of this takes time and it takes work and it takes. Um, you know, the time that it takes in order to be able to organise the seminars and the working groups and, and to give people the opportunity to contribute. You can't ask people for their time and then demand it on an on a unreasonable deadline. Um, so while there are deadlines, of course, you've seen them and I was really clear with them to the co-authors right from the outset, those deadlines have been deliberately designed to allow people to have the time to, to, to contribute around their, their teaching workloads if they're in university, their um, you know, public holidays, all, all sorts of things. We try to think about that um, and thus the, the timeline is perhaps expanded to what you would otherwise have expected um, for, for this sort of project if it were just one person commissioned to, to write, write the piece. Um, so I think I've pretty much said everything that I wanted to say, but I wanted very um, quickly just to just to demonstrate and, and also to shout out because, as I say, without them, this this work would not be happening um, to all the people who are contributing, some of whom are, are absolutely uh, in the room. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for listening to me for all that time.